Chapter 23 The Longest Night Catherine heard the spectral boy laughing as he led Pitch's legions away from her. How amazing he was, risking everything for her and her friends. He was fast and clever, there was no doubt. Perhaps he could perform a new miracle that would save them, or find help from some quarter that she did not know. But for now, she must make sure they weren't discovered by any of Pitch's stragglers. She quickly and quietly had the reindeer cover the entrance to the cave by using their antlers to shovel snow from the floor till there was only a small lookout hole left. But despite the blockade, it was still terribly cold. Catherine's fingers ached. Her toes were going numb. She had no means of building a fire. Even if she had, she no even the thinnest tendril of smoke would let Pitch know where they were. So she wrapped North and Umbrick more tightly in the collar of her coat and huddled against the reindeer, who were far more suited to the frigid weather. As for North, though he could not move, could not even blink, his mind raced on. And what was this dashing bandit, this ex-Cossack, this long-feared warrior thinking? He was not plotting his battle plan or picturing how he would defeat Pitch. No. North was worrying about Catherine's coat. Was it warm enough? He imagined the coat would make for her if they ever got back to Big Root, using an old Cossack trick of double layering the fur. Catherine gave a shiver, and North's feelings of helplessness were excruciating. She was cold, colder and sadder than any child should be. Catherine was also deeply tired. She struggled to stay alert, tried to focus on what to do next. But the rhythmic breathing of the reindeer soon lulled her into a gentle sleep. North and Ombrick tucked tightly under her chin. When children have nightmares, they struggle to awaken, knowing that comfort lies just beyond their tightly shut eyes. But for Catherine, the nightmare was all around her, so sleep was her escape. She spent the night drifting in and out of dreams, but hers were no ordinary ones. There's a rare kind of dream that children have, a dream that unfolds like a storybook, but a story in which the dreamer does not take part. They watch, instead, the adventures of someone dear to them in a sort of movie of the mind. And the dream Catherine was having starred Nicholas St. North. North was a hero of a thousand adventures. He was not a wizard, a thief, or a warrior, but a powerful figure of unending mirth mystery and magic, who lived in a city surrounded by snow. This kind of dream is so rare that most dreamers do not understand the magic it holds. It plays in tandem somewhere else, the same exact adventure and images rolling through another person's sleep. And that was what was happening now. As North lay there helplessly and nearly without hope, he began to see Catherine's dreams in his own head a city of snow in a flurry of activity, and him, as he'd never imagined himself as, or even thought possible, happy and at home. He was the master of this domain. For the second time in as many weeks, North realized that this was how Catherine saw him. In the drawing she'd given him for the gin's chess box, she depicted him grander than he was in real life and now she saw him having an important place in the world. Then the dream did something that only dreams can do. It became a part of North, became his dream. It lived in his heart now and would never die. With a violent suddenness, the dream ended. North was awake again, but he could not see. Catherine's coat covered his eyes. There was a blast of cold air, then shouts, and he felt himself being jerked up. He heard the furious neighing of the reindeer and the sound of hooves and antlers clattering against metal. Pitch had found them. North felt another jerk and heard Catherine screaming, Get away! Then something shadowy pressed tightly around them. Catherine's coat was gone from his face, and he could see her curled in a tight ball on the ground, surrounded by fearlings. The reindeer were struggling wildly in ropes and chains of darkness, but the restraints held tight, and they dashed their hooves on the cave floor with fury. North was caught in the grip of a fearling. 
he was suddenly turned around and saw the giant face of its gin glaring down at him. Pitch's laugh rumbled out of its metal chest. Little man, Pitch said, in a voice oozing with m malevolence, how useless you've become. Then his gaze shifted to Catherine. I once had a feeling Prince slip out of my grasp, but it won't happen again. But before I turn you into a feeling princess, I want to hear one last scream. He smiled wickedly at the feeling holding North. Crush him. Now. The feeling threw North violently onto the rock floor. The sound of his hitting had a sickening sharpness. The toy North lay shattered. Catherine, using a might that surprised even herself, broke away from the fearlings. She would not scream. She gathered the pieces of North's body quickly and carefully. Ombrick had taught her, Ombrick had taught them all, that magic's real power is belief. And she'd seen it happen with her own eyes. So it could happen again. It had to. She raced to the back of the cave. Pitch was just steps away. In a moment's time, she'd be taken, turned into a feeling. Pitch's cackle boomed through the cave. What a feisty feeling you'll be, he laughed. The djinn's robotic arms, the same ones that had carefully caught her that day back at Big Root, cut violently through the air. Then, they stopped. Pitch could not move closer. He strained with all the strength he possessed, but the machine arm would not obey. This cannot be, he hissed in disbelief. Catherine didn't waste a second. Her hands worked nimbly, and she set the last piece of North's form into place. She took a deep breath, then whispered Ombrick's first spell. I believe, I believe, I believe. Please be real again. This will work. I believe. But before Catherine could even finish her plea, a terrific rumbling came from outside the cave. At first she thought it was thunder, but as it grew louder and closer, she realized it was coming from the ground and the sky. She looked towards the cave's, cave's entrance, as did Pitch and his fearlings. The sky outside was brightening. The rumbling intensified until the cave began to shake. Outside could be heard the calls and howls of fearlings and nightmare men. Then, without any forewarning at all, the entire top of the mountain blasted away. They ducked down to shield themselves, but the haze of snow and pulverized rock, they realized they were safe. They stood exposed now. In the open air, they could see all around. It was an epic sight. On every mountain and every valley, on the ground, and in the air above them were swarms of nightmare men and fearlings. Every inch was nasty with shadowy hordes, but closing in from all sides was a wave of magnificent hairy creatures, white as snow, big as the bear, and armed to the teeth. They were cutting through Pitch's creatures like surf does to sand. With a deafening clap of thunder, the clouds above parted and the moon shined down. From it came a fleet of moonbeams led by none other than the spectral boy. They raked the skies, felling every dark creature that faced them. His anger sharpening to a deadly point, Pitch turned again to Catherine and the others. What he saw enraged him even more. North stood before him, no longer a toy, but a man, with his head cocked back defiantly, his cape blowing in the wind, and a saber at the ready in each hand. Catherine, or something, had broken the spell. Dark and sinister imp, he said to Pitch with cheerful sarcasm. How annoying you've become. Then he fell on Pitch with a fury. Their blades struck at a pace that seemed impossible. Catherine could barely believe what she was seeing. North had returned, and he would not be denied. If Pitch was faster than any human, then North was now his match. Their sabers exploded with strobes of fire and sparks. They taunted each other as they fought. How does it feel to have your own invention best you in every way? challenged Pitch. North smiled and replied, What I make, I can destroy. I've scuttled other planets, burglar. You're just another inconvenience. North shook his head, then lowered both his swords. 
He stood up straight, spread his arms, and closed his eyes. Do your worst, Pitch, he said calmly. What sort of trick is this? asked Pitch. I can slice you in two before you can lift a sword. But there North stood, insultingly at ease. He even began to whistle. Pitch could not resist. He swung his blade with all his might, but his metal arm stopped just an eighth of an inch from North's brow. Pitch was flabbergasted yet again. North opened his eyes, glanced Catherine's way, and winked. It's the drawing in his chest, he said slyly. He can turn us into toys, but with his own hands he can't do us real harm. Your artwork is a very powerful gift, my girl. North had just enough time to process what North had said and to realize how he was beaten. For now. Catherine almost giggled with relief and amazement. Pitch looked out at the battle raging around him. He could see the tide going against his troops. He was no fool. He turned sharply back to North and Catherine. I'll keep the gin as a gift. Let's just say it suits me. Then he took to the sky, transforming into the djinn's flying machine. Within seconds, he and his feelings were mere black spots on the horizon, vanishing westward, just ahead of the coming dawn. Chapter 24. The Journey's End Only minutes had passed since Pitch's retreat, but they'd been filled with wonders and revelations. Pitch's spell of enslavement had only partially affected Ombrick. Like North's, his physical body had been turned into a toy, but eons ago, Ombrick had learned how to separate his mind from his body. He called it astral projection, and only used it rarely. It's quite risky, he explained to North. One can never be entirely sure what the body may be up to while the mind is out and about, and it depletes one's energy rather severely. I'll be hungry for months now. And in fact... Ombrick had been eating provisions from the infinity bag non-stop since he'd returned to his body. He seemed to relish in telling North and Catherine about his adventure, for he paced back and forth excitedly. The moment Pitch had cast his spell, he'd told them, Ombrick had projected himself to the temple of the Lunar Lamas. The Lunar Lamas were a mysterious brotherhood of holy men who devoted their lives to the study of the moon. Their temple or, as it was properly called, the Lunar Lamardry, had been Umbrick's true destination throughout their journey. History had no accurate record of how the Lunar Lamas had come into existence, or how exactly they had come to devote themselves to the study of the moon and the man who ruled it. Umbrick had first heard of them as a boy in Atlantis, and even the greatest minds of the long-lost place found them elusive and confounding. But Ombrick knew in his ancient bones that these men would at least be interested in Pitch's return and had to be helpful in ways that no one else on earth could be. The Lunar Lamas were extremely secretive and cautious. They had never made contact with the outside world, not even with the wizards of Ombrick's stature, and they had not been welcoming when Ombrick first arrived. Ombrick had pleaded with them, did they have a relic from the Moon Clipper? Something that had fallen to Earth? Something of great power? But the Lamas had sworn to keep all they knew a secret until ordered otherwise. Apparently, they had a way of conversing directly with the Man in the Moon, though it was invoked only under the most extraordinary circumstances. What circumstances could possibly be more extraordinary than these? Umbrick had demanded. Pitch is here! His hordes are on the other side of these peaks. The sworn enemy of your master has returned, armed to the teeth, and means to make something considerably more than mischief. But the Lunar Lamas were the most serene men on earth, and no amount of arguing could get them to hurry. They'd gathered in the courtyard, paddling silently in silver slippers, their hands hidden in the sleeves of their billowing silk-spun robes, their round moon-like faces as pleasant and inscrutable as melons. "'We appreciate your concern,' said one llama. "'We understand your frustration,' said another. "'We sympathize completely,' said the next. "'We regret the situation,' said the fourth. 
"'We must receive a sign,' said another. "'We hope you understand,' said the last. "'Sorry,' concluded the one who had spoken first, smiling. "'Their response had left Ombrick livid. "'It was fortunate that he was astrally projected, "'for had he been in physical form, "'he may have punched each and every holy man "'squarely in his moon-shaped face. "'Then a most auspicious thing had occurred. "'Streaking down from the sky came the spectral boy.' He landed in the courtyard of the Lamadry, skittering to a scuff, right in front of where Omric and the Lama stood, his staff in hand, the diamond dagger glowing brightly at its tip. Omric had recognized him immediately. It was the very same boy who'd driven the fearlings away back in St. Alfclausen, and it had been instantaneously apparent that the Lamas had recognized him as well. Their response to the newcomer couldn't have surprised Omric more. They'd murmured excitedly among themselves, then knelt and bowed until their foreheads touched the floor. Ombrick drew a deep breath, willing himself to hold his tongue. And it took great, great restraint. Here he was, the greatest wizard in the land, and yet those llamas were bowing, bowing, to this, this boy. Heads still pressed to the ground, the llamas all began speaking at the same time. "'Tis the sign we have been waiting for since the beginning of our order. "'The guardian of the man in the moon, the one with the diamond dagger, "'the one who stopped pitch, he is called Nightlight. "'Nightlight. "'Omric had never seen that name in his ancient texts, "'the texts about the Golden Age. "'He eyed the boy. "'He seemed all arms and legs and grin, "'and he emanated the soft glow of a young firefly.' Could this ghostly slip of a boy be of such importance? The llamas gestured towards a huge gong that hung behind them, beckoning Ombrick closer. It was clearly one of their most prized possessions. Ombrick felt a shiver of great excitement as he examined it. The gong wasn't simply a beautiful instrument. The elaborate carvings were actually telling a story. The story of the man in the moon. "'Sar Lunar related it to us centuries ago,' said the great High Lama. "'It is as he saw, experienced and remembered. "'There it was, in picture after glorious picture, "'as described by Sar Lunar himself, "'the majestic moon clipper at full sail. "'The merry moonbots and moon mice. "'Ombrick could barely still his mind to take it all in. "'And then, there, on the far side,' was the part of the story that had always been a mystery to him. Ombrick glanced from the boy in the picture to the boy in front of him. They were the same. It was true. This boy had been the loyal friend and guardian of the young man in the moon. He had protected the prince from nightmares, and his diamond dagger had pierced Pitch's black heart at the height of the great battle. It was this act that caused the great explosion that saved the man in the moon and sent Pitch's galleon plummeting to earth, where it crashed like a meteor and lay hidden, deep under the ground for centuries. This spectral boy was a true hero. Nightlight! the llamas shouted in union. Nightlight indeed, concurred Ombrick with surprise. The boy rocked on his heels before them, a puzzled sort of of look in his pale green eyes. It was so long ago, yet that name still existed within him as a distant memory. He cocked his head, then shook it. What mattered to Nightlight was the here and now. The battle was still on. He swung his staff towards the sky. The llamas and Ombrick looked up. Pitch's minions were diving toward them. They'd followed Nightlight there, just as he'd hoped. He'd observed the lunar llamas, and he knew that they had the best weapons against these shadowy creatures. To Ombrick's amazement, the llamas switched from whispering statues to men of action. Bells rang, horns blew, and a great rumbling, as if the earth itself were growling, filled the courtyard. Ombrick looked out through the columns that marked the entrance of the building. A legion of giant, hairy snow creatures was gathering outside of the Lamadry, already in military formation. It was an army of abominable snowmen. 
Ombrick had read about them, but had never seen one. They had an amazing arsenal of gleaming clubs, swords, and spear guns, all forged with the dust of fallen stars. The creatures stilled as the llamas began to blow their tribal horns, their horns that sounded the battle charge. And charge they did with nightlight leading them, through the mountains and towards the peak where Pitch had trapped Catherine and the others. The llamas accompanied the army, whirling like tornadoes, Devrish's banshees. Omric instantly projected himself after them, and arrived, evidently, at the most opportune time. Just as the battle had reached its tipping point, and North was turning back into his full-sized self, but Omric did not know that he was still up in the sky above. He feared he was too late to save his friends, and had blasted the mountaintop to smithereens in a desperate attempt to intervene. Though Ombrick hated to admit it, he now felt he overreacted, ever so slightly. Most unsubtle bit of conjuring, he conceded, as he finished his story. More like something you, Nicholas, would have done in your early days. I could have accidentally hurt someone, one of the reindeer, or even young Catherine. Can't imagine what got into me. Even an astral projection can blush with embarrassment, and Ombrick, for the first time in several hundred years, did that exact thing. North laughed in astonishment. You're as red as the setting sun, old man, North teased. He was just worried about us, Catherine interrupted. Harmph, Ombrick muttered, and then kept himself busy searching among the pulverized bits of the mountaintop until he found his discarded toy body and projected himself back into it. Within a few moments, he had broken the last vestiges of Pitch's spell and returned, as North had, to his flesh and blood self. North narrowed his eyes. How did you do that? And furthermore, how did I do that? The wizard paused and regarded his apprentice. You know, a daydream properly utilized can be the most powerful force in the universe. One need only dream of freedom and begin to break the spell of enslavement. North nodded. His teacher was right, but he knew that for him it was something else. It was more than a daydream that brought me back, old man. He looked down at Catherine. You saved me in many ways. He reached for his compass that hung from Catherine's lapel. His gift had served them both rather well. Catherine had her great adventure and North had found a friend for life. He turned to the old wizard. I came to your village in search of treasure, but I found a better one than I ever supposed. Ombrick looked at the ground and was quiet for a moment. When he spoke, it was with real and gentle compassion. I told you once there was no magic in the world that can change a human heart. You've proven me wrong, my young friend. Then he smiled fully for the first time in centuries. But the friends couldn't dwell on this lovely moment. Now that everyone was safe, they were rushed to the Luna Lama Dury. The Lamas had judged them worthy to receive the highest honor their brotherhood could bestow, and the ceremony was ready to begin. There is no place on earth where the light is as bright and clear as in the Himalayan mountains, Ombrick said cheerfully, as he... North and Catherine stood atop the tower of the Luna Lamagerie. No other place is as close to the moon. Why, we're on the highest spot in the world, and one of the most beautiful. The Lamagerie was a simple palace of lapis lazuli and opal mosaics, and it managed to keep the cool, serene feeling of moonlight even in the morning sun. Bells and gongs began to ring from all around the temple that sat in the center of the Lamadry. Catherine couldn't stop staring at its roofline, where thousands of silver bells chimed with the slightest wisp of wind. What do you suppose will be given? she asked. I hope it's food, North joked. Omrick has already eaten everything in sight, and I'm afraid he'll start chewing on my coat. Omrick shushed them both as they entered the courtyard. The entire Brotherhood of Llamas stood at attention, as, as did an honor guard of the giant shaggy warriors. 
What are they called again? whispered Catherine. Those in the outside world call them abominable snowmen, but the llamas refer to them as yetis, Umbrick whispered back. The great hulking creatures had never seen a child before and were fascinated by Catherine. As were all the denizens of the llamagery, especially the half dozen birds, enormous in size, their wings silver tipped, which the llamas cared for. They were the great snow geese of the Himalayas, a species of bird unknown to anyone outside the lamagery. Umbrick mused, I must remember to notate these geese in my notebooks. Catherine had already included them in her journal. She was the only child in the history of the world who had ever seen them. I should very much like to ride one. They are big enough, she whispered loudly. But Ombrick held a finger to his lips, and she knew it was truly time to be quiet. The trio was ushered to the center of the courtyard. The reindeer grazed along the edges, raising their antlers to salute as they walked by. Catherine could barely take her eyes off the beautiful gong Ombrick had told them about. She scanned the carvings for her friend, the spectral boy, Nightlight. She was glad to finally know he had a name. Where is Nightlight? she wondered. Of all people, he should be here. But the ceremony began without him. The Grand High Lama, who looked exactly like all the other Lamas except for the gilded scepter he carried, stepped forward and struck the great gong. It made the most melodious sound that the visitors had ever heard. As it rang out, the gong began to turn from solid metal to a clear glass-like substance. Through its milky translucence, they could see the moon. Murmurs and speculation filled the air. Could it be? Was this really the moment the llamas, everyone, had been waiting for? As the gong's reverberations quieted, the moon seemed to swell in size. Then a face emerged from the craters. Immediately, the llamas knelt down in reverence. Here before them was the kindest, gentlest face imaginable. Sar Lunar, gasped Umbrick. He caught Catherine's elbow. Yes, it was the man of the moon. His image flickered and waned like light through the lush swaying trees. His image was not stable, but dotted with shadows and static. Still, there was no denying that he was there. His voice was calm and velvety, almost musical. Greetings, my valiant friends, he began. You have faced the greatest evil of any age, and yet you never wavered. Each of you was willing to sacrifice everything for this cause. Such bravery, such skill, such wisdom you have shown. For that, you have my deepest thanks. North, Umbrick, and Catherine, feeling humbled and self-conscious, gave awkward bows. But this fight is far from over, the man in the moon continued. Pitch lives and will not stop. Can you, will you, continue the fight? The three looked at one another for a quick moment, but they knew what their answer would be. North unsheathed his sword and held it at attention. Ombrick did the stain with his staff, and Catherine raised her dagger. The man in the moon smiled at them. It was a smile of such warmth and friendliness that it made any who saw it feel as though no matter what trials were to come, all would be well. Then you will need help, said Sarlunar. At this, the Grand Lama pulled from his robe an ancient weapon and held it out to them. It was a sword, so unusual that North who thought he'd known and used every weapon in creation, stepped forward to take a closer look. On its blade was a golden orb that glowed, and on its tip was a crescent moon. There are four other pieces of my moon clipper that fell to earth in the last battle of the Golden Age. If these five pieces are brought together, they will become a most formidable weapon against pitch. This first piece was my father's sword but this is not merely a sword for battle. Within its workings are many of the secrets of the Golden Age. Whoever wields it will need great learning, wisdom, and courage. Who among you shall take it? Instantly, both North and Catherine thought of Ombrick, but before they could speak, the wizard stepped forward. 
he took the sword from the Grand Lama and examined it with his usual intensity. Oh, the wonders the sword must contain, he thought. The ancient secrets it will finally reveal. But then he raised one eyebrow and gazed at North, and in one quick move handed him the weapon. You are my apprentice no more, he said with a warmth North had only heard him use when addressing Catherine. You have learned all the lessons I can teach and have more than earned this. North was stunned, and for the first time in his life, truly unsure. Omrik, I'm not ready, or deserving. You waited all your life. Omrik's right, interrupted Catherine quietly. North looked at her, searching her young, brave face. She had always known what was best for him. In her own way, she may even be wiser than Omrik, he thought. So North took the sword. As he held it in his hand, he felt a, not a great rush of emotions, but a strange calm, a certainty of purpose, a sense of belonging that he had never known before, as if his whole life lay before him and he knew how it would play out. It would be like Catherine's dream. He looked up at the man in the moon's image. The man in the moon was waiting for his answer. You have my pledge to use it wisely and well, North said, now and always. Watching from the highest tower of the Lamadri was nightlight, unseen by anyone. His focus was distracted. He was scanning the nearby mountains for any sign of pitch, but he wanted to join his friends. He held his staff close to his face, the little moonbeam in the diamond dagger tip this moonbeam who had started this whole great drama into motion on a winter's night that now seemed so long ago, could sense his longing. It glowed brightly and seemed to say, Go on, we're safe now. Nightlight laughed his perfect laugh and flew down to join them. He landed them in the lamadry, quick and playful, and taking Catherine's hand, pulled her into the sky. The llamas cheered, the snow geese honked, Ombrick grabbed a huge cookie that he'd hidden in his robe and cheerfully devoured it. Nightlight and Catherine spiraled in the air. The man in the moon glowed brighter than the llamas had ever seen. And for that one day, all of their worlds seemed safe and right. The weeks that followed were quiet. They'd all earned a good rest. Ombrick ate so much that the yetis, who oddly were accomplished chefs, could barely keep up with his appetite. I doubt we'll ever have another stretch of days as calm as these again, mused North to Catherine as they stood on the temple's parapet days later. Catherine was sketching the snow geese in her journal. I suspect these are our halicum days, North added. Halicum days, she asked. Ah, one of those ancient words Ombrick is so fond of using. It means happy and carefree. North grinned and added, I prefer battles and adventures. Catherine knew what he meant. All these new amazements were in their lives. Abominable snowmen, giant snow geese, lunar llamas. She wondered if Santa Clausen would still feel like home. She closed her eyes and for a moment to remember her life as it had been. Images of the villagers. Old William, Little Fog, the Bear, Petrov and Big Root. All of it flooded her memory. And she missed them, but she'd also become accustomed to all this danger and adventuring. Still, despite all this, she felt a sort of peace. It's the bliss of victory, North explained to her. It's a feeling you'll have to get used to. Catherine's face grew serious. But we didn't defeat Pitch. True, but we lived to fight another day. Catherine thought about that. Then she tugged a fresh stick of charcoal from her coat pocket and began to draw. North looked out towards the horizon and thought of the dream Catherine had given him. The gleaming city that he would someday build and the man he might become. A strange and exciting future lay ahead for both of them. The possibilities were endless. Battles would be fought, wonders revealed, many journeys, many lands many joys, many sorrows, but stories all. 
And that is the end of book one, Nicholas St. North and the Battle of the Nightmare King by William Joyce and Laura Gerginger. The next book is E. Aster Bunny and the Warrior Eggs at the Earth's Core. Hope to see you next time.